So welcome to the webinar for lecture 15 and today we're going to look at rational equations. So we've been dealing with rational expressions and finding common denominators when we add or subtract them or learning how to cancel factors when we are multiplying or dividing. Um, so today we're going to look at equations that involve e rational expressions, okay? And we kind of saw some of this before, okay? We kind of saw a little bit of this before when we, although there weren't technically rational expressions in our, um, in our equations, technically, what we had, <coughs> excuse me, what we had was, was just fractions in our expressions, okay? And so let me kind of show you what I'm talking about here. Before, we saw, for example, in the work problems, when we had something like this, we maybe we had t over 5 plus um, 1 half is equal to 1. And we just had denominators, right, that were num numerical. And we had to find the common denominator. In this case, it would be 10. And what we did before was we would take that 10 and we would distribute it into the every term of the equation would get multiplied by that 10, okay? So we distribute it into both sides of the equation, okay? And so by doing that, once we found that common denominator, what happened was it would clear the fractions, okay? And so we'd end up with something like this. We'd say 5 goes into itself once into 10 twice. So what's left is 2t. Okay, then 2 into itself once into 10, 5 times 5 times 1. So what happened was we learned how to clear the fractions from our equation. And it made it look normal, right? It looked nicer for us. We didn't have to deal with the fractions. We could proceed with solving, you know, which we know how to do. And it's much nicer for us when we're dealing with non-fractions, right? Divide by 2 right here, and we have, what, 5 halves. Okay. So that's something that, that we can do. We can find these common denominators. And you guys really do know how to find common denominators of rational expressions now because you've had to deal with adding and subtracting them from last time. And so you have that under your belt. So you kind of have the skills you need to do these. The problem with the ones that we're going to look at with the equations involving the rational expressions, two things. Number one, the rational express rational equations, I should say, I should say, they can be tedious. Okay. Number two, there's a little more to think about with these because what is possible is it's possible for us to have what's called an extraneous solution. And let me see if we have one in this example here. Um, yeah. No, these are good. Okay. <laughs> it's possible to have an extraneous solution, okay? And so let me write this down, okay? So take this note. I'm going to define this now, and what we'll do is every time we solve one of these, we're going to have to check extraneous solutions. Okay, and let me put check for extraneous solutions. Okay, and what is that? That would be like a false solution or a fake. Okay, in other words, I'm going to give you the um, give you the 411 why I'm calling it that. What it is is the solution is not in our domain. The domain. In other words, if we use the solution, it will cause a zero denominator to happen. And so we do have to go and replug things in and check and make sure that's not what it is, you know. We're going to run into one or two today. So that's just something, it's not even a special situation with these. You always must check every time. And it's pretty simple to do. Sometimes you can just eyeball it and see that. It, uh, something will cause a zero denominator, you know. 
But let's go on and, and just practice some of these. What I have here in this A and B, let's look at A and B right here. Okay, what's going on is we're going to find the common denominator, right? So let, let me kind of put a little thing here on the side, on the right, okay, how to go about solving. Let's just kind of review that. How to solve rational equations or fractional equations, however you want to call it. Okay. So number one, you need the LCD or the least common denominator, least common multiple of your denominators. Okay, we, they nicknamed that the least common denominator. So find that. Okay, so we need to find the least common multiple. Really, any multiple of the denominators will work. You're just going to make, if it's not the least common multiple of those denominators, it's going to be a lot more work and a lot more tedious than it has to be. <clears throat> okay, so I'm writing this out. Once you find that, you're going to distribute that denominator, that common denominator. LCD into thoroughly into both sides of the equation. Okay. <clears throat> this bigger. Hello. More room. Okay. All right. Carefully and thoroughly. Let's put that word there just to be safe. All right. Every term on both sides of the equation will get multiplied by that, okay? And I'm going to help you guys with which step of that should you show, because it'll I can help you maybe to not write as many steps, but write the correct ones that will help you work efficiently. That's that's what I want to do for y'all today. Some of these, there's no way I can help you help them to be shorter, but I can help them to not be as tough as they need to, as they could be. Okay, I had to have a sip of my drink. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. So um all right, making sure my mic is plugged in well too. Alrighty. <clears throat> um no, did not mean to do that. Go back up. Okay. So once you do that, um you're gonna cancel. Okay. Thirdly, so we'll simplify. Go away, iCloud thing. Get out of here. Oh, I hate when that thing pops up. <laughs> okay. Simplify um, all that those distributions, and then you're going to continue to solve. Okay. Let's see. Simplify and solve. Okay. That's pretty much what you got to do there. Now, when you first start doing these, try not to skip too many steps. You know, um, you want to get used to what's going on in, in those intricate little calculations you're going to have to do. Okay, so just be very careful with that. Now, in A here, let's look at A. Okay, so we're here. Let's look at A. All right, and... Um, make it a little bigger. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> okay, so what we're going to do first is find the common denominator, and really we just have this H, okay? So H will be our common denominator, and we're going to have to distribute H into both sides of the equation, okay? So what it'll look like is this. We'll have and I'll try to make the common denominator, at least in the first step, what's happening, you know, as far as distributing something into a, an equation to both sides. Okay. I'll try to make it a different color so you can highlight it. Okay, so we have the left side and the right side. Okay. All right. This step I'm writing here is one that I'm writing right now just to illustrate it to you. Eventually, the only step I need to see is this next one where you actually 
go ahead and distribute it into the actual sides because that's the one that's going to help you cancel and, and, and simplify it and you need to show that. So we have h squared and negative 2h equal to now look here's where the ridding of the fraction happens there so we just have an 8 on the right side and it does turn into a quadratic look at the square okay so let's go ahead and keep going let's let's go for it we're gonna get 8 to the left and try to factor this thing okay so we'll have h squared minus 2h minus 8 equal to 0 <clears throat> Let me come up here okay and or they're factors of 8 that have a difference of 2, 4 and 2. So that's good, h and h. We want to have a minus 4, right? Because that 2 is negative, 2h is negative in the middle because of this guy here. Okay. And so minus 4 and then a plus 2. Okay. So this is the correct factorization of that. And so because we have h minus 4 can be 0, or h plus 2 can be 0. Of course, now you go on and solve these separately, right? So we can have h is 4, and h is negative 2. So here are my two solutions. And what I'm talking about as far as checking extraneous solutions is taking the 4 back to the original equation, h minus 2 equal to 8 over h. And if we put a 4 in, particularly into the denominator, it's fine. I'm not going to have a 0 denominator, right? You see, negative 2 is fine, too. Okay, and so that's what we mean by that, okay? We mean check, make sure you don't have something that's not allowed in their domain, okay? Input. Now, if you look at B, B, what would make B 0? I mean, the denominator, in the first denominator in B. Let's take a look. Look where I'm highlighting in part B. What would make that denominator zero out? A negative one, right? Okay, so check it out. So we don't want x to be a negative one, right, for B. What about the next fraction denominator? Okay, what about x? So we don't want x to be zero, right? We do not want zero. So if either of these things come up as a solution to our equation, those would be extraneous solutions. That's the point here. Okay. So also these are restrictions on the domain. Okay. Okay. These guys are restrictions on the domain. Restrictions on the domain. The domain. How do you like that? I meant to put a capital B, D, domain. In other words, this is what we exclude from the real numbers, right, to when we state the domain. So the domain would be all real numbers except for negative 1, 0. Okay, so we talked about that a little bit last time, so I'm not going to go into that too, too, uh, too hardcore, but I'm going to go into this here equation. Let's solve it. Let's do that. Okay, so the denominators we're concerned about would be the x plus 1, x, and 6. And so all of that would be my least common multiple of the denominators, or the least common denominator would be 6x, x plus 1. All that multiplied together. <laughs> I have a question. Let me see. I'll pause here and check out the questions. So question B is not a solution. Um, no, I haven't done it yet. I didn't solve it yet. Okay. Okay, Lulu, I'm ans my answer to you, your thing is I have not quite, it's not, no, that, those are just not going to be solutions if they come up. We're solving it now. We're going to see. I like to build the suspense, you know, sometimes <laughs> in my long-windedness. Okay, guys. So let's, let's do that. Let's take that common denominator here, and we're going to distribute it into both sides of the equation. Wow, pens is going nuts today. Okay, so um, let me get rid of this. It's kind of stepping on the toes of part B. 
Okay, so we're solving this. Let's take that. This is the part I do want to see. This is a step I would like to see. I want to see y'all take the least common multiple of the denominators and, multi and write it as being multiplied times each term. Okay, and that's going to help you. This is the longest step you're going to have to do. Just be very careful because, like, there's our equal sign, right? All right. I meant to put those darker. I'm going to go darken up the original problem in a sec. So 6x, x plus 1, and then 1 over x. Okay, take this minus sign next, right? Minus 6x, x plus 1 times the 1 over 6. Okay, so where's our original equation in all this, okay? Here's the original terms. I'm going to highlight those in it with a blue, just to kind of remind you. So we had 1 over x plus 1, we had equal, and we had the 1 over x minus, and the 1 over 6. These were the original terms. We've just go ahead. We went ahead and distributed the 6x x plus 1. So now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to cancel out. Each term has something that will cancel now. Okay. So here we go. In the first grouping. Okay. So I'm just looking. Let's see. I'm just looking here. Okay. And I'm just going to kind of circle it and highlight instead of highlighting it. Just looking there. Okay. <clears throat> and so my x plus 1, the whole x plus 1 cancels with itself here. And so what's left is I have a 6x and a 1 to multiply. So that leaves me with a 6x. And then the equal sign is next. Now in the next grouping there, okay, now I'm just looking at this little group, this term. And inside that term, we want to simplify. x is canceled there. And so I'm left with 6 times x plus 1. And I'm going to wait to distribute that just to be safe, okay? Now, the next highlight, let's see, the next term is here, okay? I'm just going to kind of join it all together like that. Okay, so the 6s will cancel, okay? 6 goes into itself once, and up here, 6 goes into itself once. And this is why I wait to, to distribute, because we have a negative, right? We have minus. We have x and then x plus 1. Because see how it gets a little messy right here? You want to be very careful about that. If you go try to distribute in that same step that you do your cancellations, you really do run a pretty big risk of, of sign rule errors and other rule, other errors. You know, plenty of errors. So be very careful. We want to just go ahead and write those multiplications. Notice how I'm writing the LC D, the denominators that I'm distributing in, the least common denominator, it's kind of high, like it's in, it's in the numerator, right? I do that because it keeps it, the eye, it's a trick of the eye. Because this denominator, I want this guy to cancel with this guy. So, and I'll see that, I'll spot it a lot better if I kind of keep numerators a little higher than denominators, right? Okay, so the next thing we do is we're going to distribute. Okay, so we'll go ahead and take care of that, and it should get quite simple from here. So we'll have 6x, okay, equal, and then 6x plus 6 minus x squared, what, minus x. Watch your signs there. Let me check this question here. Okay, all right. All right, so we do have a quadratic again. Let's go ahead and combine like terms, and then we'll go there. So I'll have 6x. So we'll put this minus x squared here. And then we have what? 6x minus x, right? 6 minus 1, okay, so plus 5x. And then the plus 6 is, goes down next. All right. What I would like to have is a positive leading coefficient, right? We would like this guy to be positive, right? So what we would like to do then is move everything over to the left, right? Over there with that single 6x and put 0 on the right.
If I do that, I'll be what? I'll be adding x squares on the right, and it'll pop up on the left side as positive. And so let me go for it. Let's try that. And so you kind of could do a little mental math with that and just move it to the left and make it opposite. So that'll help. So we'll wind up with x squared. Okay, and I'm kind of not worrying about these guys over here. I may or may not get to those. I'm just working on B. All right, so we have x squared, and then we'll have this 6x that exists, right, already. What, minus 5x. That's this guy moving over. And then we'll have minus 6, because we're subtracting that guy. Then I have 0 on the right side. So let's simplify that, and we'll get to solving it some more. We'll go to a next step. All right, long story short, here is what this quadratic looks like. And you want to ask yourself now, are there any factors of 6 that would have a difference of 1? And there are, there's 3 and 2. Some of, once you get these things into the simpler version of the equation, even the factorization is a little easier than, than um, even in previous sections. Plus 3 minus 2. Okay. Alrighty, let me get this little dot out of our way. Okay. All right, so now what? X, in this case, X could be negative 3. I'm going to go ahead and just write it like this, do the quick version. X could be 2. These are the values that would zero those binomials out. Okay. <clears throat> and, of course, these are the solutions I need to go back and check. I just need to be sure these values will not cause a denominator to zero out from in my original equation. In other words, I need to go take a look. I need to compare, let's see, compare these guys when I'm checking to the denominators in my original equation that contain variables. Right? The 6 is fine. That I'm not worried about that. That one's fine. And no, Negative 3 will not cause a 0 in any of the denominators, and a 2 will not cause a 0 in either of those denominators. So these are both real, they're good solutions. They're not extraneous. They actually, they stay. We keep them. We keep them for our solution set. Negative 3, Lulu, what you mean negative 3? Right here, the first one is negative 3. Let me see what you're talking about. Uh, no, it's positive 3. You mean in the factorization, possibly? No, it's, it's, this is correct. Because we have positive 3x minus 2x giving us this positive 1x, okay? So the larger of the two would be, would have this sign when we're factor, factoring. That's, I, I'm assuming you're, you're talking about the factorization. Okay, you guys, let's move on. All right. <clears throat> Uh, well, yeah, we're getting up to that, Steph. Don't worry. That's probably next. Um, let me let me take a look and make sure. Uh, ready? Yes. Oh, yes. They're coming. Those are coming up next. Actually, we're probably about to do one of those right now. Okay. No problem. You are very welcome. Okay, so let's get back in here. See, actually, do you see part D down there? It's coming. They're building up to those. In order for me to get straight into those, it's important that y'all see these because the, the process is the same. Notice from the very first one I did where all I had was numbers in my denominators up through the biggest, ugliest common denominator you could find. This process is the same. So any of these, practicing any of these fractional exp exp equations is going to help you a lot. Okay, <clears throat> let me go and check for one that's got an extraneous solution. Hold on. Let's see what I got for you. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, let's do E, okay, um, yeah, we're going to do E, oh my goodness, um, hold on a second, oh my goodness, 
So hopefully you guys will try. I've tried D, and um, if you haven't and you're watching the recording though, go ahead and try D. You can pause the recording and try D here. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm giving you the least common denominator. So um, you can pause it now and come on back when you're done. Just press play again when you're done and uh, see if you got it. So what I'm doing here is I'm setting up the distribution of this common denominator into the original equation. Every term must be multiplied by it, right? Here's that subtraction. And here's the second term, the x minus 4 over x minus 3. See, it can get tedious, but this, this step is important to, to do. Okay, I mean, some people can maybe do it in their head. I don't even like doing this part in my head. So now I have every term in the original equation is set up being multiplied by the least common multiple. Okay, and so what we'll do is we'll start canceling the entire factor, right? The whole binomial cancels with the whole binomial. And what's left is we have, what, 8x. Let me make that a little higher there. Okay. There we go. So we have 8 and x going to be multiplied by 8 minus x minus 3. Okay. Next one. So we have x minus 3s. These guys cancel, and we're going to have quite a nice big size multiplication coming up. Right. So let's write what's left over. But at least we don't have the denominator part of that. You know, it can make it a lot worse. So. Let's go here, the 8's cancel, and all we have are the x plus 1 and x minus 3. Okay, so even though it's still a little long and tedious, it's not as bad, right? That last step I did, that's going to be the biggest, longest step you have to write. It should get smaller from here. If it doesn't, go back and check your work. So let's multiply all this stuff up one by one, right? Let's just take it one term at a time. You just got to chip away at these, and they start getting a lot nicer, okay? So 8x times x, 8x squared, okay? 8x times negative 3, negative 24x. Of course, every time you go to distribute like we're doing now or multiply, you want to combine like terms in the next step. That'll help as well. For this one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait to distribute the negative 8. I'm going to go ahead and FOIL this guy first, okay? Put it in parentheses there. We'll have x squared, let's see, um, negative 4x plus 1x is minus 3x, and then positive 1 times negative 4 is negative 4. Of course, we have to FOIL these guys, right? Okay, and so we have x squared, what, negative 3x plus 1, is so minus 2x. Let me get rid of all this there, making this messy. So that's the square. Okay. So minus 3. Okay. So let's go for it. One more of these steps where we're doing this and we're going to distribute this negative 8, right? This guy. One, two, three terms. And then we'll combine like terms when we're done with this. Section all that off. Okay. We're just working on D. So 8x squared minus 24x. Now let's distribute that negative 8, negative 8x squared, negative 8 times negative 3 is positive 24x, negative 8 times negative 4, plus 20, oh, 32, excuse me, 32, equal all the stuff on the right. Let's bring it down. Now on this left side here, I need to combine the like terms. Okay, let's combine some like terms. So we have 8x squared minus 8x squared. So that that's kind of nice. That goes away. Yay. Bye-bye. 24x minus 24x goes away. Thank you. Okay. So all we left with is this 32. So we have 32 is equal to x squared minus 2x minus 3. Now look, my leading coefficient is positive on the right. So I'm going to move everything over to the right and have my 0 on the left. So I'm really going to subtract 32 from both sides. Okay, so it'll cancel here and leave me a 0. 
And on the right, I'll have x squared minus 2x, and then what? Minus 35. Of course, factors of 35 that have a difference of 2, 5, and 7. So we can factor it, yay, minus 7 plus 5, right? Because we have negative 7x plus 5x to give me this negative 2x. Okay? Of course, this is equal to 0. So now what I need to do is find my solutions from these factors. So for the x minus 7, that if that's 0, that would make x equal to 7, right? A 7 would make this one 0 out. For x plus 5 to 0 out, it, x would have to be negative 5. Okay. Are either of these any extraneous solutions? Will a 7 0 out my denominators? x plus 1, x minus 3? No, right? A negative 5 will not it zero out anything here. So these guys are in the domain. So both of these solutions are good. They check out. Really, when you check it, you are worried about zero in your denominator. But those are fine. Correct. Good job, Lou. I saw you. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay. So give me one sec. I'm going to find one that does that for us. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Okay, oh wait, we have to move on. Dog go on it. All right, let me do one more of these. Let's see if I can find one. Um, let's pick one. Let's find one that we'll have. Actually, let's look at number two here. Okay, let's look at this little word problem here. Okay, I'm probably going to go and delete some of the word problems from your assignment or let you choose. So let's look at number two right here. When two is subtracted from a number x, okay, the result is equal to three over x. Find all possible values for x. So let's kind of uh, suss that one out, see what we got. Okay, so let's just look at first, let's look at when two is subtracted from a number x, okay? All right, so 2 is being subtracted, looks like that, from x. Okay, the result is equal to, is equal to 3 over x. Okay, and so this is it. Let's find the possible values, okay, for x. Really, that'll be, that'll be whatever our solutions come out to. Okay, does everybody agree with this? Okay, good. So what is our LCD, our least common multiple of our denominators will be the X, okay? So we'll take an X, okay? So that's your LCD, right? That's what we're going to take and distribute into the entire equation. So let's see, here's my pen. So we're going to take x, x, and the equal sign x. Hold on, I'm setting it up. Okay, so we'll have x times x minus x times 2. This is my original equation I'm kind of putting in there. And then x times the 3 over x. So there's my original equation. Okay. Okay, and so... Let's go ahead and look what happens there. That that x it will cancel with itself on the right side there. I just went ahead and do get the right simplified. Let's multiply the other guys. X squared minus two x equals three. Let's subtract three from both sides. Okay, we'll have x squared minus two x minus three equals zero. Are the factors of three that would give us a difference of two, three and one? Okay, so x, what, minus 3x plus 1. Okay, 0. So now x could be 3 or negative 1. Neither of these will cause x to 0 out. If I had gotten a 0, though, then I'd have an extraneous, and what I would do is simply just x through it and, and exclude it from my solutions. 
but as it is these are fine and I'll just include them what I'll do you guys is I'll find a video with some extraneous solution example on it or I'll do one after I'll have to go and look for one maybe I'll run into one yet we'll see but let's move on to the next topic because we're running out of time and I have to uh, get moving um, I want to talk about what a relation is okay let's see <clears throat> A relation is merely a set of ordered pairs with a domain. The domain is the x values and the range is the y values. That's it. Okay. And so that usually does help. Like what they said here is this. Notice that x, y, right, is in alphabetical order and domain and range are both in alphabetical order. That should help you remember which one is which, right? The domain and x's go together, and the range and the y values go together, okay? So here's a relation in this example above, okay? It's just a set, notice we have our set brackets, a set of ordered pairs, right? We have x, y, x, y, a bunch of ordered pairs. Values that are included in my domain would be the x values. These guys are members of my domain. That would be my input values. These are the domains. The range values are, are taken from the y's. These guys are the range. That's your output. Okay? Range. Domains. I meant to just put domain singular. Okay, and then the y values are my range. Okay, so here we are. They've written it out this way. Okay. All right, and look at the example here, this one at the bottom of the page. <clears throat> Let's state the domain, okay? And for this class, for our purposes, you can go ahead and use just a big D, a capital D for domain and then a capital R, not the fancy real number R though, just use a capital R for the range and we'll be fine with that. Okay, so for domain we just want to pick out our x values and list them. Okay, so the domain is negative 5, the set containing negative 5, 3, and 2. And actually we can go ahead and put them in, in ascending order, that would be fine. Okay, you don't have to keep them in the order they're given to you in, as you see in the last solution up above. Now the range, it would be just the set of y values. Okay, so we have what? We have an 11, we have a 10, and we have a negative 12. So what? The range negative 12, 10, and 11. Okay, inputs and outputs, remember that. Okay. All right, all right. So now what we're going to do is just I want you guys to check out um, the idea. I'm going to show you guys how to tell. There's a little thing called a vertical line test that you can use to suss out whether something is a domain is a excuse me a relation or a function. And this will help it, me to introduce to you the idea of a function. You've seen function notation, okay? So the a function is a relation okay let me uh let me kind of write this down let's see uh, i'm going to make a spot right there so let me write this kind of big the way a function what, what defines a function okay an actual function is a relation a set of ordered pairs right where every x is associated with a, a y, a single y. Every input, right, and that's x value, right, every input is associated with one output. And the way we define this is kind of weird. It doesn't sound quite like it is, but here's what it is. 
if you look at this points here on this this graph, okay, I don't know if you can make them out, but I'm going to go ahead and, and fill them in a little better for you with the blue. There's one here. Okay, what is this point? This point would be what? Negative 3, 4. So this is the point negative 3, 4. Okay, here's the point, what? 0, 2. 0 left to right, up 2. Here is the point up there, 5, 5. Y'all see 5, 5 up there? Whoops, not that. Here it is. It's 5, 5. Okay, and we have the point 7, 2. And finally, we have the point 2, negative 3. So, this is a graph of a set of ordered pairs, okay? So, check it out. Okay, so here's our relation. Okay, our relation would be these values, these ordered pairs, okay? We have negative 3, the ordered pair negative 3, 4. Okay, and let's just go left or right with it. 0, 2. Uh, let's see, 2, negative 3. 5, 5. And 7, 2. All right, and close your set. And the domain here would be what? Negative 3, 0. Pick your x values out for your domain, 5 and 7. And your outputs or your range. Notice outputs are the up and downs, right, the y's. These guys would be, and we can list those smallest to largest, negative 3, 2, 4, and 5. Negative 3. 2, 4, and 5. Okay? All right. Here is the best way for someone to be able to tell if this is a function or not. There is something called the vertical line test. Okay? And the vertical line test says this. Let me kind of do something right quick. I'm going to white out that 7 for us so we can, uh, we can uh, use that space to write. <clears throat> okay, let me make some space right here. Okay. <clears throat> okay, the vertical line test tests any relation, even if it's just ordered pairs. If you can plot it on a graph, you can test with the vertical line test. Any vertical, if you can find any vertical line that will pass through the graph more than once, it's not a, a relation. It's not a function, okay? But, and let me state it differently better for finding a function, okay? The vertical line test is, um, let's see, a graph is a function. Even if it's just ordered pairs, like I said, a graph is the graph of a function. A graph of a function. If any vertical line, vertical line, passes through one point at a time. Any vertical line you can find, I should say any vertical line passes through only one point. Let's put that. Only one point. And let me show you what I mean, okay? Okay, let's just go. Anywhere here, if, if there's a point, let's draw a vertical line. See, I'm drawing a bunch of little red vertical lines. And anywhere along the graph that I draw a vertical line, I can only intersect one point at a time. So this is a function, okay? So that is a function. Okay, let me give us a little room here. Hold on. Come down there. Okay, let's look at this here, okay? I'm going to use the, the vertical line test to see if this represents a function, okay? And let me find, let's see, okay. And, uh, well, let's see. Okay, there it is. Finding my pen. 
So what we have here is kind of like a partial, only a portion of a parabola, okay? It's kind of there. <laughs> Make that not quite as ugly. And here we go. All right, so it's kind of like a, the top part of the, the hump, the top hump of this parabola, okay? Is what's in the picture. Any vertical line, and I'll keep that with red, okay? Any vertical line I draw along the picture here, okay? See, just draw a bunch of little vertical lines. It's only going to intersect through one point at a time. So this, by the vertical line test, this is a function. Okay, the vertical line test tells me this is a function. Okay. All right. So really, that's pretty much what you need to know. I mean, what a function, what the vertical line test is doing is testing to be sure that every X is associated with only one Y, one up and down, one vertical coordinate. Okay. Now, here's one up here. Look at A. Okay. If you look at part A there, let me come up here and grab my pen. If you look at part A, all right, and I'm going to kind of quickly graph it. Zero left to right up two. Here's the first point. Negative two, zero, two, zero, zero, negative two. Look down the very center there, and you see that we do have a vertical line that will intersect through two of those points. Okay, because of this vertical line intersecting through two points, this would not be a function. So you see, even with just sets of points, you can use the vertical line test. It works. Okay? Because there, there are two points where they're one on top of the other, okay, like that, like, like in this picture, this stops it from being a function, technically, by definition. So we have already looked at function notation. So, but just to kind of remind you of function notation, I'll, I'll do one of these. Let's take a look at number four, just to kind of, and then we'll have to call it a day. But let's look at number four today, okay, for now. All righty. Um, I want you guys to try it, but um, try number four while I kind of white out everything else here. Let me white out these guys. Here we go. Okay. All right. Cool. Ah, what did I do? Okay. Sorry. All right. <laughs> so, all right. It made some room. Let's look at just number four there. Okay. And so F at negative two, that's too thick there, would be, okay. And so what you're going to do is open parentheses. And this is a four, by the way. It's a fourth power x to the fourth power minus 4 over x squared plus 2. And I'm just making the template, and I'm going to come back in and insert this negative 2. Okay, they're asking me to evaluate this function at negative 2. And so that's all you're doing there. You just Now you go in and use your order of operations. That's it at this point. Use your order of operations. So that old concept is not going to ever leave us. Okay, that's always going to come back. PEMDAS, right? Okay. And so let's do our exponents first. So negative 2 to the 4th power will be positive 16 minus 4 over negative 2 squared is positive 4 plus 2. Okay, so what do we have? We have a 12 over 6 or Two. So finally, okay, I can give you like the little in conclusion symbol. F at negative two is equal to the number two. I can also say that this represents an ordered pair. That this is x and this is y. Negative two, two would be a point on the graph of that function. Okay. So um. That's basically function notation. We've kind of seen it a little bit. Um, you'll see it again, you know. 
Finding the domain, look at number nine, I'll do this one. Finding the domain and range of a function. What you can do to do that is, is this. And let me kind of make this thick. I'm making a scanner. We're going to pretend like this, this vertical bar that I've just made here is a scanner. Okay. Like your computer scanner, okay. And look what I'm going to do. I'm going to scan from left to right. Ah, if I can grab it. I'm scanning from left to right. Okay, and everywhere my scanner picks up function from left to right is my domain, okay? And notice, I think they're intending for this thing to stop. Okay, let me move this, okay. They're intending it to stop. There's no arrows here. This is a point, that's the last point on this graph, and this is the last graph left to right on this graph. So, back to my scanner. Let me go select my scanner. Okay, moving left to right, it's going to start at this first x value. So my domain would start with, and actually we'll use interval notation because it's continuous. We're going to go from negative 8, oh gosh, not infinity, negative 8 through, now let's get on the scanner again, turn the scanner on. You have to go from left to right to do the scanner. It's not missing any function. It's picking up function all the way until the very end, right, where this point, actually x is 8. So from negative 8 to 8. Okay, so this is interval notation, the interval between negative 8 and 8. Okay, and our range will scan from bottom to top, okay, for the range. Let me go get this scanner, okay? So when you're scanning for range, it's your Y values, and that's the height, right? So we need bar height from the lowest point to the highest point. Now you want to ask yourself, at what point do we start picking up function? Right here, don't we? So wherever this point is, that's going to be the first endpoint of your interval for range. So it starts at 2, and actually it's inclusive. I should have used brackets on top as well. Let's put our brackets up there too. Sorry, guys. So here's your brackets, and we're going to use a bracket here and a bracket there because this is a closed point up there. So we start from 2, and our scanner will continue to scan from lowest to highest part. It doesn't stop here, right? It doesn't stop there on the right. I keep picking up function, I'm scanning a function all the way up till this highest part right here, right? This this guy, 8. All the way even where y is 8. The scanner trick, a lot of students have, have kind of liked that. You can use your paper and pencil, just you hold your pencil above a graph and scan, or even a, in between your eye and the screen and scan for domain from left to right, and you'll see you're picking up function from negative 8 to 8 on the x's because domain deals with X's. Okay, you can even write, some people do like D with a subscript of X to remind them you're dealing with X. And for range, a subscript of Y to remind you you're dealing with the Y values down to up, right? Okay, so use the scanner trick, okay? That helps a bunch. So there's my scanner trick. All right. All right, so that's basically it. That's all the time I have for y'all today. I have to kind of move along. Let me see if we have questions. Do one light, one two. Oh wait, me off. Stephanie, we did we did do that. Let me see. You're talking about. Um, look, do you see my screen right now? Can you see that I'm on the homework thing? Do you mean like three binomials, three different binomials? All three sides have X. Ah, I could try to do one quick, fairly quickly. Let me see. Um, it's done the same. I tell you what, Stephanie, stick around, okay? Can you stay after we're done with the uh, thing? And I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you. I'll help you in a minute, okay? Actually, meet me in the office. If anyone needs help, I'll be back in my office uh, later this afternoon. Um, Stephanie, you hang out, though. You stay or anybody wants to come immediately following this. 
But you guys, I'll be in my view office this afternoon, I think after two. Oh, no, that's my time. I'm sorry, afternoon, your time. So, um, you know, um, actually, I'll, I'll leave a message in the general forum when I'm in there. I have to go to the DMV, so I better uh, work on that. Lou, if you want to hang out, too, you can. You can okay? Um, so, uh, yeah. All right, you guys, y'all have a great day. I'm going to have to cut the uh, webinar off right now. So, you guys, it's awesome. If I don't get to talk to y'all, y'all have been an outstanding group of students. I want y'all to know that. And wonderfully patient. And um, I hope I run into you guys again in a, in a more advanced class in the, in the future and maybe even in your career. And I get to see you guys in your glory. And I, I'll, I'll be so proud of you. I already am really proud of all of you. So, uh, we have a final coming up. And well, I'll give you guys some more information on that in a future message. Okay? Yes, Lou. Right after. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.